Sure, my name is Nathan McCree and I'm a composer and sound designer for computer games. Yeah, so I guess um, the fundamental difference was uh, in the software that we use to uh, write music and make sound effects. Um, my first jobs, uh, or music and sound jobs, uh, were for the Mega Drive, Sega Mega Drive system. And uh, in fact, I, I started at Core Design as a programmer. Um, and my first assignment was to write a music sequencer for the Mega Drive. And this took us about four months to sort that out, and I had a couple of months spare. Uh, so I thought I'd write some music on it uh, to demonstrate how it worked. And uh, when Jeremy, that's Jeremy Heath Smith, my boss, uh, when he heard it, he said, you know, this is great. Can I get you to, you know, write some more music for us? So, of course, I said yes, and I had a job change overnight. But the way this sequencer worked, it was a little bit like, uh, I think some of the audience might know what a music tracker is. And it looks a little bit like a fruit machine. You've got four or six reels, and each reel is a voice. And it can play one note at any one time. So if I've got six reels, I've got six notes of polyphony. But with those six notes, I've got to reserve one channel for sound effects. So I've actually got five notes. And when you're writing orchestral music with five notes polyphony, that's quite a challenge. Um, so it's all about, you know, as the reels tick by, these are like measures or quantizes. So you can have, say, 16 ticks per, per beat, et cetera, et cetera. And so if I'm playing like a four note chord and a bass, and then I've got a melody, um, that's my five, in fact, no, that's six channels, isn't it? So, but I've only got five available. So the idea is you, you've got your bass and your four, four notes for your chord, and the melody has to fit in between when the notes are hitting. So this kind of forces your melodies to play in between the other notes that are going on. So for instance, I can't have long drawn out notes because it means I can't then use one of the notes of the chord tapping away because it's going to interrupt my melody note. So your melodies ended up being short, staccato, little tunes that and they would like pop in and out of the chords that we're playing. And I think that's that was quite, um, uh, how can I, I can't think of the word to describe it. It was a thing that often happened with chip music. Um, you, would, you would hear these melodies just blipping and blopping around. And I think that's probably where people got this um, uh, notion of bippy boppy, you know, uh, computer games music. Um, so that was quite a significant challenge, try, trying to sort of replicate orchestral music with very limited resources. Well, I think, you know, it, 
it's easy, it's probably easier to make electronic sounding music because you're making it with an electronic chip. So it lends itself to making sawtooth waves and, so, and sine waves and square waves. Um, so I think, you know, in, in terms of writing stuff quickly, that's probably the most, uh, uh, the most common style of, of music and, and sounds that would have been made using that uh, chip. Um, but it's, of course, possible to make sounds that sound close to strings or close to horns or close to plucked, you know, double basses and things like this. It just takes a little bit more effort and a bit more refining of the, the parameters that you've got to work with. Yeah, sure. It's, it's possible. Um, you might have to use your imagination a little bit. Yeah, I mean, memory constraint was ridiculously small then. Um, and so, you know, we had lots of compression routines, uh, which after we'd plugged in all the data, and that's not just the musical data, but the actual sound patches, because we had to actually make the sounds as well, um, using, you know, FM synthesis and all the sort of parameters of very basic synthesizer. So all those patches had to be stored. I don't know, we would typically use something like 100 or 150 patches for a game. So that would include all the musical patches and all the patches for the sound effects. Um, and then there was all the data for the music as that was rolling by on the reels, like I said earlier. And so once we had that data, that would then run that through a compression routine, which would just squash the whole thing down into a, a smaller space as possible. Um, and then the actual sequencer itself, that would also go through uh, the code for that. That would also go through compression routines. So we'd end up with this tiny little fragment, this tiny little thing, which was running and doing all this stuff, which was quite phenomenal, I have to say. You know, some of the things it could do was really amazing. You know, we had pitch shifting, vibrato, um, all sorts of loop commands and repeat commands and, and that stuff that was going on, which also had to be plugged into these reels that they were going by, you know, these music control commands. Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a really complex, but um, concise system. Uh, you know, for me, it's, um, it's been really useful. Um, to, to have that background in computer programming. Um, and it still is today. You know, when I talk to uh, programmers on, the, on, on teams that I work with, um, I know when I'm asking the earth of them or when I'm asking something that just is a five minute job. And <clears throat> so sometimes, you know, I'll say, oh, can you do this? Can you, can you program me this? And they'll be going, well, yeah, we can, but it's gonna take a couple of weeks, you know, and I'm like, uh, really? You know, I, I could probably code that in a day. They're like, well, maybe a couple of days. And I'm like, okay, thank you. That's better, <laughs> you know. So um, it does help me know, like I say, you know, what I'm asking. Um, and also, you know, because I understand the principles of their job, um, you know, it helps me when I'm designing audio systems um, and, and, and when we're sort of planning the project as a whole. Um, and, and, I, and I think moving on from that, you know, it's very important to understand all the disciplines um, uh, of making games. Uh, the more you know about the other people's jobs, the better you can design your systems um, and, and, and the less time, or, yeah, the less time that you will waste of other people's work, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's really, really important. Yeah, okay, so that was, a, that was a really big leap for us. Um, you know, all of a sudden, we were competing with pop artists and producers and orchestral scores and live orchestras, and it was like, oh, my God, you know, we really have to up our game. And, but, of course, you know, we didn't have a full orchestra. You know, games were still considered the poor cousins of movies and um so you know okay i could have i could abandon the the mega drive yamaha chip and instead i brought in three i think it was um keyboards 
you know, proper synth machines. Um, so, you know, my sounds were suddenly a lot, lot better. Um, but I still wasn't using any samples. We still really weren't in that technology um, yet. That, that really hadn't come about. I mean, there were sample-based things. I mean, even the Amiga was playing samples, but again, the limitations were, were, were so tight. It wasn't really a good solution. So I found that using, you know, synthesized orchestral sounds actually was pretty good. And, um, you know, again, with a little bit of care and attention, I could get things sounding as close to an orchestra, certainly close enough to fool people. Um, I remember playing one of my uh, Soul Star tracks to my old music teacher. And I said to him, what do you think of this? You know, I wrote this and he said, that's great. He said, uh, who did you get to play all the instruments? And I said, well, I played them all. And he's like, what? He said, well, but, but, I, mean, I mean, the orchestra, he's saying. I was saying, well, there is no orchestra. It's just synthesizers. And he couldn't believe it. And he was my music teacher. So, you know, I was pretty convinced at that point that I was doing the right thing. Um, and, you know, I, I just perfected that, really, over the next few years. Um, I mean, we were, and we were, another thing that kind of convinced me I was doing the right thing was with Soulstar, uh, I persuaded my boss to uh, enter the music into a, 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 an awards ceremony. And we managed to pick up um, a nomination award for Best Computer Game Music 1994, which was great. Unfortunately, the game that actually won the award was, I think, Rebel Assault, which used John Williams Star Wars music. I was like, well, you know, if I come second to that, then, you know, I'm a happy chap. Big change in, in, in how uh, music was operating inside the games. Um, you know, the chip music was, was very much sort of loop based <clears throat> and we could basically have constant music going, you know, without any breaks. And we could switch from one tune to another also without any breaks. Suddenly with the CD stuff, we couldn't do that. So. It was a bit weird because although the technology had moved forward, we'd lost some uh, some facility. We'd, we'd lost something. Uh, you know, normally you'd think that technology would would bring you enhancements. And it did in one way, but in another way, we'd lost something. So yeah, we had to rethink. You know, how we were going to use music um, to describe our games, and <clears throat> I guess. It kind of encouraged, certainly from my perspective, a more sort of storytelling approach to writing music. So, um, you know, I would think about when the player reaches a certain point in the game, I would then have to sort of, <clears throat> you know, imagine how long they were going to take to get from A to B and write a piece of music that sort of described that journey and hope that they took that long. And if they didn't, <clears throat> well, you know, we'd have to think about, do we re-trigger the tune? Do we wait 30 seconds and then re-trigger it? Do we re-trigger it only if they come back into the area? Or if they've been there before, do we not trigger it? So there's a whole load of other uh, considerations that we uh, had to adopt to, to make these things work. Yes, it did influence uh, Tomb Raider, um, particularly because it was a, uh, a free world sort of environment. And, you know, we really had no idea of how long the player was going to spend in a particular area. Um, we needed another way of creating an atmosphere instead of just plastering the thing with music, which I thought was the wrong approach. A better approach for me was to you know, make the, make the audio sound more real life. So instead of using continual music, I used continual ambiences. So I used the CD tracks <coughs> and I would just record a sequence of atmospheric sound effects, caves, water dripping, you know, a few creature noises going off in the background. And these would be about three minutes long. And they would fade out quite slowly so you wouldn't actually be aware that the track had finished. And just as it faded out, we'd send the CD back to the beginning and start it again. And so there'd be a moment, you know, 
couple of hundred milliseconds as the CD head time went back to the beginning again, where you'd actually have no sound at all. But, you know, you've got her footsteps, and generally speaking, they're not just stood still. They're usually running around. So we actually covered those gaps just enough um, and provided this continual atmosphere. And then, you know, when the player got to a particularly awe-inspiring moment or some dangerous point in the game, then we'd trigger the CD to go to a piece of music. So you'd lose the ambience and you'd go straight to this piece of music. Dun, 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 dun. And of course, but then you didn't really need the ambience because suddenly the action was on and you were firing guns and it was all mayhem going on. And once the battle had finished, we'd skip to the ambience again and you'd hear the cave dripping come in again. So it worked. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, but yeah, an, an, an interesting uh, uh, process to sort of relearn uh, audio design triggering. Yeah, so um, we were using uh, Cubase at this point, which was vastly superior to my Mega Drive system. Um, yeah, it was just, it just made writing so much faster um, and, and, and much easier. Um, you know, and I could use a keyboard, a proper keyboard, instead of a QWERTY keyboard, tapping in C sharp, you know, and then where's the, where's the G and, you know, that change was just brilliant. Um, and of course it meant that I could improve my piano playing skills and, and I got very, very good at playing the piano, which I was really pleased about. Um, it got to the point for me where I was playing as fast as I could think. And, and I didn't have to think about my fingers anymore. They were just automatically going to the notes that I was thinking of, which was a really fantastic feeling. Yeah. Well, I'm, I was always quite surprised about how successful Tomb Raider was, I have to say. Um, and, and, and I'm still st stunned to this day how, how much people have enjoyed the music. Um, you know, it, it, was, it was a crazy project because, the, you know, back in those days, there was, no, there was no game design document. It was just somebody had an idea, you know, and, and the boss went, great, let's make it. Right, off you go. And so we all started making, well, you know, what, what, what are we doing? What are you doing? Okay, are you, what, you need some audio? Right, okay, well, let's put this in. And well, yeah, you're gonna have to code it up, you know, and it was just a, it was just a mess. Everybody was just chucking stuff in and then hopefully one day, you know, it was out on the shelf. And, um, you know, I remember I'd, I'd written a load of cues for the game, music. And um, I said to Jeremy, because we'd all been working nights and uh, weekends for ages. And um, it, it, was, it was the last weekend and we were going to be releasing on Monday. And it was Friday and still none of the music had been implemented. And the programmers weren't ready. To implement. They were still busy doing other stuff. And I was like, well, look, we've got to get this music in. You know, we've got two days, man. You know, and well, we're not ready, we're not ready, we're not ready. And I'm like, I'm like well, look, I'm, I'm gonna go home. When you're ready to stick the music in, call me. It doesn't matter what time of day or night it is, just call me and I'll come in. I only live five minutes down the road and I'll come in and, and, we'll, and I'll tell the guys where to stick all the tunes, where to plug it all in, and, and, and we'll just go through it. We'll just blitz it in 12 hours or something. No phone call. I came in on Monday. So what happened? What happened? Oh, it's out. It's, it's gone. It's released. I'm like, what? But, well, hey, what, what, you know, what happened with the music? Oh, yeah, you know, Toby stuck it all in last minute. I'm like, joking. So I'm then playing the game frantically, looking at where all the music triggers are, and I'm just going, no, I can't believe that. Oh, no, that should have happened. Well, no, why did he do that? And this tune was cut in half, and that tune was cut in half. And I was like, all oh, my work. You know, not the last hurdle. Someone else had just taken that and, and gone and done it. So, you know, it was, it was a bitter pill to swallow. And, and that's why I'm just amazed and really, really thankful that, you know, the fans liked it so much, because it, it really has changed my life in so many ways. Um, and I'm very, very lucky to have written that music and, and to have gone on and written the, the next two in the series. Um, I still get fan emails to this day, people saying how much they enjoyed it, and, and I'm really, really grateful for that.
Yeah, I got a little bit more time on number two, and I spent a lot more time on the implementation with that. And the same for number three. You know, I worked closely with the designers, um, getting the triggering for the music right. And you know, we talked earlier about, you know, when to play, and if the player goes back to the same area, should we re-trigger and stuff like this. So yeah, it, it was an improvement certainly for numbers two and three. Yeah, so, the, the, yeah, respect for audio, respect. Uh, so I, I was gobsmacked, I remember, once in the early part of my career. Um, I was talking to Jeremy, um, and uh, I, I was moaning because, you know, there wasn't enough time to, you know, get the audio polished properly. And it, this was a constant moan I had with, with Jeremy, and I'm sure he'd verify that. Um, and one day he said to me, look, Nathan, for God's sake, you know, nobody gives a shit about audio. You know, we could sell exactly the same number of units if there was no audio in the game than if there was audio in the game. And I said, how can you say that? That's absolute rubbish. How can you say that? He said, well, I'll tell you how I can say that. Because we sell the number of units we sell based on whether the magazines give us a good review or not. And when we send our beta version or alpha version to the journalists to review the game, there's no audio on it. We haven't put any audio in the game. They're playing a silent game. And they give us 10 out of 10. And we sell a shitload of copies because of that. Now, he said, we, we could actually release that game with no audio on it, and the kids would still go and buy it based on the review in the magazines. And my heart sank. And I had to think really hard about that. And again, that was another really difficult pill to swallow because here I was trying to fight this battle and I, I, was, I was losing straight away because I was fighting somebody who had this very strong mentality about audio and games and was not going to give me any more time or budget or anything. So the only way to improve my situation was to work more hours for no money. So, and I think... This kind of bred the culture um, in the games industry about, you know, the, the, the publisher or the developer is, is not going to pay you over time. It's not going to, they're not going to give you any more time in the schedule to really do the job that, that you care about, that, that, that you think is going to make a quality game. Then no one's going to give you any more money or a budget for that uh, or, or, or time. So your only option is to work more hours in the same time. So you end up working nights, early mornings, you know, weekends. Um, you, you, you know, many people abandon their wives and girlfriends and, and have all sorts of, um, you know, personal problems because they believe so much and have so much passion in what they're doing. They're willing or forced to sacrifice everything else in order to achieve what they want to achieve. And that, that, that's, uh, that's a mentality which I think has to change because they've been doing a lot of research into crunch and overtime. And, it, and the reports is that it's clearly damaging for projects uh, and personal relationships as well. So, you know, roll on that change. So as audio director, I spend a lot of my time with my head in a spreadsheet um, and, you know, emailing and talking to people, um, making sure we stay on target with the schedule. Um, I deal with external clients. Um, I will prepare budgets. Um, I also talk to the composers about, you know, the style of the music and how I want that music delivered. So for instance, I, I may not necessarily want just a stereo mix. Sometimes I want all the individual stems and then I will control those stems, you know, once we plug it into the game. So if we want more action, I can bring in the rhythm sections. If I want it to be nice, peaceful and safe, I'll strip all that out and just have some the searing sort of string parts or whatever other pads. <coughs> so that very much depends on the project. Um, the sound designers, you know, I will talk to them about the style of sound, you know, if we're making a 
comedy game or a cartoon game, obviously the sort of the style of the sounds is very much different to if we're making a horror game or, or some real live action, some war shooter or something like that. Um, so, you know, I think the job as the audio director is mostly about communication and making sure that your team know what's expected of them <clears throat> and um, rewarding them when they, when they do good things and try not to hit them too hard when they don't. <laughs> you know, lots of pizza and beer and bribery gets you a long way as an audio director. How much of the creative vision of the project then is under your control? I mean, well, all of, all of it in terms of audio. Um, yeah, you know, and, and I will work with the other leads of the other disciplines and, and we will talk about, <clears throat> you know, the direction of the audio and the direction of the graphics and, and and the animation, um, and we will, you know, together review um, builds of the game and make sure that everything is all sort of moving in the same direction. Um, yeah, and so uh, if it's not right, it's uh, it's my problem to fix it. <coughs> well, I think again, it depends on the project, and it depends <coughs> who it is that's writing the music. Um, you know, there are some guys that I've worked with that I know, and I know what they're capable of. And so I can just say to them, I know what you do, and I know this is your kind of style, so go ahead and, and do it. You know, these, these are the pieces that we want, you know, and there'll be a track list, which I need from them, and I can let them go and do it. And usually they deliver exactly what I was expecting. There are other times when it's not so clear cut what the style is, not even the publisher or the developers will know and they're looking at me to deliver something that works for the game. Um, now I could sit there and write something myself but as a director you don't have time to do that so I've got to get some guy on board to do this so you know how do I tell him to write something that's going to fit for this game when I don't know what style it is or anything. So what I will do is you know I'll do a little bit of research search around on the internet and find something that I think is fitting with the game. I'll then give those reference tracks to the composer and say, we want something a bit like this, but obviously we don't want to copy it and we want to try and make something new. So, you know, give it your best shot and let, let's see where we go. When I get those, that track or those tracks, I'll then talk to him about it and go, okay, well, I like this section. This is working. This bit sounds a bit too distant from the game you know we've seen that the style has drifted at this point so can we kind of pull that section back a bit maybe add some more guitars or something or keep the keep the energy going a bit more you know <clears throat> and because I'm a composer as well it's very easy for me to communicate with him um, about that you know um, if I think the pads are too harsh or too soft you know I can explain that to him quite easily um, so yeah it, it's it's project and personnel dependent um, but again, I think the main um, key here is communication. <clears throat> okay, so I talked a little bit about, you know, living in a spreadsheet. And it's very much like that. Um, you know, my spreadsheets are, I think, something to be admired. Um, I'm quite proud of them. <laughs> um, they track every single sound, every single VO line. They track the status of the audio, so that comes from, uh, or can be not required, not started, work in progress, alpha, beta, or placeholder, alpha, beta, final. And the same I track for the implementation status. So, uh, and then I have a sheet for each category of sounds. Footsteps, impacts, weapons, ambiences, music, whatever. And, and, and again, this is project dependent. So obviously some projects don't have bosses, for instance, so the bosses tab can go. But generally speaking, I have something like 10, 12, 15 sheets. And each sheet will have hundreds and hundreds of sounds on it, each being tracked. Um, so, you know, when my designers deliver their assets, um, I will tick them all, you know, I'll check that they're, they're in, whatever you. Um, so we would have 
the first delivery would be probably some uh, alpha quality. I would have maybe put in some placeholders prior to that if my coders needed to test something. But generally speaking, once I've given them the design doc and they've coded that, we should be able to drop assets in at an alpha level straight away. Um, they then are checked, they're, te they're tested, and if they're good to go, um, I can upgrade those sounds straight to final. If they need some modification and they have to go back to the designer, um, sometimes I'll downgrade it to placeholder. If the asset is okay, like if somebody held a gun to my head and said, we're releasing the game tomorrow, I can go, mm, okay, I can let it go at alpha. But generally speaking, I will want to upgrade alpha sounds to beta. And that just means contextually they're okay, but they perhaps there's something wrong with the sound, maybe too much bass or, or it's too loud or whatever. So the beta phase is just to kind of fine tweak the sounds and then they're pretty good to go at that point. If I really want to be picky, I will maybe review beta sounds again and do a final polish, upgrade them to final, and then, and then we're good. And so all those sheets are being tracked. All those sounds are being tracked on the sheets. And then I have an overview sheet as well, which calculates um, percentages of completions of all those statuses, both asset deliveries and implementation status. So at a glance, um, if my producer comes to me and says, Nath, how are we doing on the audio? I can go, we're 73% alpha, 10% beta, 3% final. And he goes, great. And he walks out the door. Now that, that's really useful for a producer because they just want numbers. Um, so that sheet is really important. Um, it's also important for me because, <clears throat> again, at a glance, I can see where we are. I've got a rough idea how, how much work there is to do, how much we've done. And I can also see each category, which one is slipping, which, which one is at 20% and which one's at 80%. Um, so that's kind of how I manage that. And I, I also have a, uh, a schedule sheet as well, which details all my staff and it lists uh, all the tasks that they've got to do in a, in a calendar structure. So I can see each week what they're supposed to do and whether they've done it, whether they're slipping, whether we need to add more resources to that particular track. Um, and hopefully it all finishes at that green line at the bottom, which is the release date. Yeah. So <clears throat> largely that's my decision. Um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll prototype a particular monster, um, we'll bung in a load of sounds and, and, and then watch him, watch him work in the game. And if we find that his attack sound, rah, 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 you know, if, if he's doing that a lot um, and we've just got one sound there, you know, you're going to hear that it's just very repetitive. So it's like, mm, okay, let's rethink, let's give the guy six different raw sounds. Now, prior to that design, I, I don't know how often he's going to be doing the attack because that's very much down to code and the animators. In fact, it's not really the animators, it's down to code, really, how that monster is interacting with the player. And I don't know how that's going to work until it's actually in the game. So very often, although the design from a sort of implementation point of view is working, its functionality is there, um, it's only at alpha. So the beta level is, okay, we need to multiply the number of variations on this, or maybe we need to tweak some parameters, do some more pitch control or volume control or something, and make it a little bit more variant. So um, uh, the other constraint that I need to be <coughs> uh, concerned with is memory. There's always a memory limitation, and there's always a memory battle. Um, and those memory battles can be pretty harsh sometimes. Um, so, you know, I, I'm always trying to get more memory from the programmers, um, and I'm always trying to steal more memory from the artists or animators or whatever. Um, sometimes I might have to buy them a pizza or something. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, you know, we have to think about that, and, you know, we have various tools that will give us memory readouts, real-time memory, and you know, storage memory. Um, 
and you know we have to work within those parameters. And uh, as an example, you know the the impact table for Silent Hill, when we started out with that, <coughs> we had uh, I think it was two thousand cues, but we started out with ten variations for each cue. So that was twenty thousand twenty thousand sounds just for our physics system. And of course, I, I was hit on the head by a few of the other guys saying, you can't do that. You can't have that many sounds in the game. It's using up too much memory. And I said, well, how about if I could shrink that? How about, you know, let's keep the same number of sounds, but let's supposing I could reduce that memory by a factor of 10. Would that be OK with you? And they'll say, OK, fine, if you can do it. So I had a look at the audio files, and I wrote a script which trawled through these 20,000 sounds and trimmed them and cut them. And I did. I reduced the memory impact by a factor of 10. And everybody was happy. And I kept my 20,000 sounds in the game. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges is um, uh, guarding against ear fatigue. Um, you know, it's very tempting to put put in sounds for everything, you know, and, and also to turn everything up. Oh, I can't hear it. Turn it up, turn it up, turn it up, turn it up. And suddenly you get this cacophony. Um, and I, I think, yeah, one of the biggest challenges is, is getting the balance right so that you're not just bombarding the player's ears. Um, because it causes discomfort, which they, they won't be... A, necessarily aware of what's going on, but at some point they'll just go, oh, turn that music off, or turn it down, turn it down, you know, and this is, this is a sign that their, their ears are becoming, uh, or starting to feel uncomfortable, and it causes distress. So, you know, I think you have to be careful about that, and, and giving them too much to listen to, um, and, and, and trying to consider, you know, the flow of the game, how long they spend doing something, how long they spend in a particular area. Um, you know, you can spend ages sculpting sound for a particular environment or a particular room. And then when you play the game, they're in there for five seconds and then they're out again. And you're like, okay, I spent a month on that room. You know, so it's really important to play the game and, and work out, okay, where, where are the problems? Where do they spend their time? You know, where, where is the puzzle? Where, where's the bit where they're just stuck for ages? Um, you know, so talking to the testers and finding out from them, you know, what, what are the key moments in this level? What are the high points? Where are the bits that, are, that you know, that are really good and the bits that are just boring and you just fly through, you know? Um, so it, it's about getting to know the game. That, that's really important. And, um, and trying to give the, the player a break from his ears. Uh, well, um, so QA um, tend to report on things that either don't work. Mm, yeah, it's usually that. Um, you know, somebody's firing a gun, there's no sound playing. Um, the boulder drops on the floor, can't hear any audio. Um, the guy's not speaking. You know, his lips are moving, but he's not saying anything. The VO is not being triggered. So they usually pick up functional problems. Um, they tend not to pick up quality issues. And um, I haven't yet worked, well, no, I, I have worked with it with, a, with an audio team that, that um, a testing team, should I say, that looks for quality. Um, but I was working for Zoe Mode in Brighton and we were making music games. So the games were all about audio, Sing Star, you know, Grease, stuff like this. Um, so most of the time, um, audio QA is done by the audio team. And that's a mountain of work, which has a serious impact on our schedule. And I think that's something which developers um, are not aware of. Um, you know, who is checking this stuff? Who has to check this stuff? You know, I can't, I can't give audio testing to the QA because they don't know what to listen for. 
they don't know if this ambience is supposed to be that loud or whether it's supposed to be quieter. I'm the only guy that knows that, or maybe the guy that designed the ambience. You know, I, I, can't, I can't tell them, well, it needs to be minus six. So can you listen to minus six dB, please? You know, he's got no idea what that is. And even if he heard it, he wouldn't know whether it was right or wrong, unless he's got an audio monitor t giving him numbers readout. I mean, it, we don't have that kind of software. So audio QA lands with the audio team. And, you know, it's just a case of going over and over and over it and, and checking things time and time again. And, you know, it's very frustrating sometimes when, um, you know, of course things change in, in game development all the time. Um, and the, the problem comes in is when a change is made and the audio team is not told that that change has been made. And then we end up, we discover just by pure chance that, oh, that fountain that was over there, that, you know, we're making that water trickling sound, they've moved it, it's now over there. But our, our audio emitter is still over there. What, why weren't we told about this? You know, so discovering those kind of problems, sure, QA can pick up on obvious things like that, but there's many other instances where, you know, it's just lucky that we keep playing the game and we find the, the, these problems. Um, yeah. That's a big. That's a big challenge. Yeah. It's a job opportunity there for somebody. To... Absolutely, but you know, um, you know, I I wanted a audio tester on many projects, um, but again, for, for him to know what the problems are, he needs to know everything that I know, which means he's got to sit next to me and watch everything I'm doing and checking all the levels that I'm doing, so he knows inside out how everything is supposed to sound. So then he has that knowledge in order to do the testing. And you come into these sort of problems and challenges of just how much time it takes. You know, if the guy's gonna be sitting with me all the time, well then when does he get time to do his testing? You know, it's a real, real challenge getting audio right in games, definitely. I think probably the most enjoyable for me is <clears throat> Silent Hill Downpour. That was that was great. I had a good composer, Daniel Licht, who um, oh, I can't remember what the, the, t the TV series that he did. He did it uh, about that serial killer, Dexter. That was it. And uh, you know the music he wrote for Silent Hill was brilliant. Um, I I don't think. I mean, I, I haven't written horror music myself, at least not adult horror. I've done children's horror, but not adult horror. And some of the sounds he was coming up with, I was, I was gobsmacked. It was brilliant. I don't, I don't know where he got his sounds from or, or how he made it. Um, but it was really, really good. And he delivered it in stems. So it was very flexible for us. Um, and the, uh, the, the sound design... Um, I had a few guys working on that. I had one guy in Brno, <clears throat> uh, three guys in England, um, and then I think another three contractors. <clears throat> in fact, one of them was my ex-boss from Zoe Mode. I employed him for a while, so it was quite interesting. I became his boss <laughs> for a short period. Um, but, you know, a brilliant guy. And, 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 and because I'd worked for him, I knew how good he was. And so when I brought him on the project and, and I explained to him, the tasks that we had to do and the time frame that we had to do it in, he completely understood and just got on with it. And I just, I didn't have to direct him. I, he just knew the problem and just managed it and, and, and fixed so much stuff. It was really good having him on board. Um, but it was, uh, I think, quite a challenge <clears throat> making sure that all those people were delivering assets which worked with each other. I had one guy doing footsteps, I had another guy doing monster VO, and he was pulling in other guys to kind of give the variety. I had another guy doing uh, um, impacts. The impact table alone, we had 
over 2,000 sounds just, just for things dropping on the ground. Uh, it was just crazy. Um, but making, you know, making sure that whole thing tied together, um, yeah, it was a real challenge. And I, and I think we did a good job at the end of the day. The, the, the atmosphere in that game was, was scary. I remember working on it late at night, <clears throat> three o'clock in the morning or something, regularly. And um, I had my headphones on and I was sat there in my big flat and I was, I was in a tiny little corner of the room. And it was a massive room, much bigger than this. <clears throat> And um, I was playing away and staying, and then suddenly, oh, you know, something would happen in the game. And I'm like, Jesus, you know, oh, I didn't know they'd put that in, you know. And, and of course, the, the game kept changing because designers were adding stuff and new monsters and new scare moments. Oh, God, you know, it, it frightened me to death sometimes. Oh, and all the hairs were standing up on the back of my neck. And I thought, well, this is working, you know. If I'm frightened and I've been developing this, we're, we're doing the right job. You know, so I really enjoyed that project. You could get your death out here if you're not careful. Got something for you. I think for me, you know, when I came onto the project, it had already been in development for a while. Um, and immediately, the thing that stuck out for me that was wrong was that it was too noisy. I thought, well, this is Silent Hill. It needs to be silent. And so, if you like, my stamp on that project was turning everything down. All the atmospheres, uh, all, all the sort of little things that were going on, I just turned everything down. So it was nice and quiet. And, you, and you, you ended up turning the game up because you couldn't hear it very well. And then when a scare moment happened, oh God, you know, it was really loud. And so we'd achieved this sort of huge dynamic range. Um, and I think that was, that was the, the biggest impact I think I had on that project, was, was putting the dynamics back into it. And, and that made it scary. It just wasn't scary when I came on the project. Everything was just so noisy, there was no contrast, and, and it wasn't working. Well, you know, you, I, I fight this corner and have been fighting the corner for a long time. Um, again, it just comes down to communication. You know, you need to. Uh, you know, a lot. A lot of people think that because they've got a pair of ears, they're qualified to judge how the audio should sound. That's not true. Um, so I need to explain to these guys, you know, why it's not working, and show them and demonstrate. This is what you've got. This is how. I think it should be. Listen to the difference. Tell me what you think. You know, t tell me if this is working or this one's working. You know, and and when you do that, it's clear. You know, straight away in their head they go, "Oh yeah, now I understand. I can see what you mean, or I can hear what you mean." So again, it's just about communication. Um, and you know, if you've got a good relationship with your team, <clears throat> there shouldn't be any problem there. Um, you know, they should trust you that you know best about audio, and I trust them to know what's best about animation or art or, or, or even you know, the programming side of things. Um, so you know, it's about those leads working together uh, as a team. If they're strong, then the, you know, the shop floor should, should work. It's getting better, um, but it's still, with some companies, it's still a last minute thought. Um, and yes, I'm still fighting that battle. I, I, don't, I don't know, you know, wh when 
or if there's ever going to be a time when we can say, okay, great, you know, audio has full respect now. I don't know. Um, it's been 20 years I've, I've been fighting that battle. Um, I, I don't really know what the answer is. Probably just education, you know. Um, you know, and <clears throat> I think maybe demonstrating a good project in terms of audio and what's a bad project in terms of audio. And if you can show people what that difference is, again, you know, that will encourage them. I'm not saying it's going to work, but it will encourage them maybe to spend a little bit more money and move the audio forwards in the production schedule. Yeah. I just want to say, um, you know, thank you to all my fans over the years. They've just been amazing. And, um, you know, I, 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 I am planning to reward them with some really good stuff, hopefully coming this year. <laughs>